lady and gentlemen. I'm Mark, and I've got some pre presentation for you. Um, Seek your training for March. First of all, I'd like to start off with uh, where to place your safety banner. And this is a classic picture. We have uh, some really good firm footing here on the cabinet here and the railing. And the railing is a kind of an angle, but that's okay because he's kind of got his hip left, right, left, sorry, right arm kind of securing him. Um, if we ever put any kind of banners up, whatever, make, let's make sure we don't do this because the next thing that happens, somebody will pull out their iPhone and they will take a picture of you. The first of the three presentations is the safety management plan. I can tell you that uh, NACE had developed a comprehensive list of procedures in their program, and we are going to, as part of Kindle, have uh, a similar program, but uh, instead of having a thousand pages, it would be like 170 pages, so it would be like one-sixth of the size. So it should be more of a practical use. In any case, um, we don't take risks here. Stop and think, slow down, don't take shortcuts, and if you don't know, ask somebody. And this is what it comes down to. Uh, define the work practice and ensure compliance with them. So if we decide what we're going to do, we have a list for it, or a procedure for it, let's go ahead and have the list developed, and then follow that list. If there are any problems, always stop and ask questions and, and reevaluate. Uh, safety is a core value of the company, and each one of us is responsible for not only our own safety, but those around us. What this means in practical terms is if you see somebody about to break their neck, say something, please. Uh, we will work to achieve zero injuries. Um, we haven't had injuries since 2006, and uh, some of that is, you could argue, is luck, but I'd say the majority of it is just the mechanical uh, safeguards we have throughout the plant and our procedures. We'll meet all the applicable re regulations to provide accurate, timely safety monitoring reporting. Um, we will continually seek to technology and operating methods to reduce or eliminate accidents and personal injuries. Uh, with various versions of, of uh, PPE we try to experiment with, with uh, certain, certain problems out there that we find a protection for, a guard for. Correction of safety hazards. If the hazard has been discovered that may cause a serious injury or illness, it will be corrected immediately or the employees will be taken away from the area, i.e. will have it barricaded. If the hazard is one that can be fixed quickly, let's go ahead and fix it. Other hazards will have to be fixed in a timely manner and we'll work on that in a timely manner. The safety committee is actually more significant here, I would think, than some other plants. Um, it's an advisory body, and it basically it, it advises the plant manager primarily. They will talk to me, but the plant manager is the main person they go to. And they'll make recommendations and take minutes, take all the information they've got from everybody for that month, and, and collect it, go over it. They should uh, provide, devise, and promote, uh, promote solutions to safety hazards that can be done with existing resources while long-term corrective action is pursued. And one little note on the existing resources, and that is that Kelly has made the use of some extra funds specifically for the safety committee so they can do some of these procedures or some of these uh, improvements. Periodic inspections. Well, they're to verify compliance of the law, identify any additional hazards, we can also use them to investigate injuries and try to figure out what happened. The documentation of safety inspections is a periodic schedule of inspections are documented on safety inspection reports in which the method to fix all hazards are identified. You can think of a very simple thing as the weekly EHS or the health and safety walkthrough that we do at, at, the, at, the, uh, at the plant. We go through that, we mark to make sure things are being are available or functioning the way they should. In addition, there's space to make improvements. Hey, we've got this problem. Bring it up to the plant manager, bring it up to me, bring it up to the safety committee. Investigations, when it, when it comes time for a near miss or uh, 
a, uh, a uh, recordable. An investigation will be performed on all accidents, injury and illness cases, and any unusual occurrences. We will do investigations when there is no accident, there is no bodily harm. Uh, inspections are conducted as soon as possible after the accident. Go look at the site, talk to the people. Other types of incidents are also investigated using near-miss accident hazard reports, that's what I was talking about. It documents the record accidents associated with property and equipment damage. We have this so we can learn from it. Um, when you're with a bigger organization, you can actually put that into a system and they can actually document patterns within the different plants. Employee training. We will receive training on OSHA required topics. Uh, testing and observations may be used to document training effectiveness and drill and emergency response uh, evolutions provide training opportunities, training, training, training. Training manuals will be maintained in each facility. Training sessions may be held during safety meetings and training will be documented and records will be maintained. In addition, we have things like the audiometric testing, the uh, forklift man lift testing. Mind you, some of these things have been slowed down, delayed because of the pandemic, but these are things that we add as far as the training of the, of the, uh, of the staff. Communication. We do have safety meetings that are conducted on a monthly basis. This is one of them. Safety suggestions. You can go in the box or go to one of us. Work orders. You can go into the system, main saver, and put up a work order for something to be fixed. And operation shifts turnovers. When you have the information, you can kind of roll that out, and that should be rolled back up uphill to, uh, to us. Contractor and visitor orientation and training. The contractor and visitor orientation and training ensures that they're doing what we're doing in a safe manner. And they will receive site-specific training and orientation. For my part, when I do give an orientation to them, I will talk to them or I'll know what the company does in general, and I'll try to tailor what I'm talking about to include that. Contractors and visitors are expected to follow the facility's safe procedures. They will follow them. Right. Number two, related to the to the process, is the PPE section. Basically, when you do a PPE assessment, you assess the nature and degree of the workplace hazards, select the proper PPE. Communicate the decisions on the permit to work, for example, and it should properly fit the employees. And remember, we are responsible for our safety and those of our coworkers. Once again, repeating that line. We have, for instance, uh, in one case of PPE, it would be gloves. And I have to say that uh, you guys are being uh, more proactive in finding the gloves that fit you, that you prefer. By all means, if you find out that there's some kind of new glove or you've heard about it from another guy at another plant or somewhere else, Buy a pair, buy two pairs, try them out, see if they're worth it. Nature only gives you 10 mistakes with your fingers, so it would behoove us to go ahead and make sure the gloves work with us. Training qualifications. They will be trained to know these the following, when the PPE is necessary, what type of PPE is necessary, limitations, how to use them, and proper care. These are all things that we have, not just in the instructions, but also we have this as far as I don't give a specific training on how to wear your hard hat. It's, it's pretty obvious how to wear that. Some other ones, safety items like harnesses, other items, they will require progressively more uh, training, more explanation. But likewise, this information I'm presenting right now is review for you. You should already know it. If you don't, by all means, talk to me. Some more limitations. These are administrative controls. We don't want to use administrative controls, but we use engineered controls, engineered solutions. The protection is only good as the PP is selected. Keep that in mind for gloves, for glasses. And the PPE could interfere with other PPE or work operations. This is the thing. I go out there, you go out there during specifically an outage. We're watching the contractors. Are they wearing their hard hat? Are they wearing their glasses? Are they behaving in a, in a proper manner? Are they in the area where they should be? 
I was on the turbine deck at one point during an outage, and this one contractor had his hard hat off. Caught my attention. But there were two flanges on these these uh, on this pipe. It was just wide enough for him to put his head in just to kind of make sure that the area was clear of debris or, or whatever, and then he put his hat back on. Now, if he had tried to keep his hard hat on while he's looking in there, it would have been more trouble. In other words, that would be a case where the PPE may interfere. When it comes to wearing PPE or any other safety thing, my philosophy would be, let's be practical about it. And if there is a very good reason why he's not wearing that PPE, let's, let's give, them, give them the benefit of a doubt in that respect. And if it makes sense, then so be it. PPE must be properly worn. And I can give you one example is the foam uh, inserts for the, uh, the earplugs. If you don't put those in properly, you just stick them in, then you're not going to get much protection. You have to roll them up, put them in the ear, and let them expand in the ear, and then you get the full protection from that equipment. That's an example of this. Uh, the PPE must be maintained and stored properly and inspected. You can think about the harnesses for this. Eye injury. Now that picture on the right is a pretty nasty picture. Uh, dust, art particles, metal, sawdust, molten metal, acids, any kind of bad vapors, blood, and other potential infectious body fluids that might splash or splatter. Can you imagine that happening? Intense light. That can, that can cause temporary or even permanent uh, uh, blindness. And uh, for instance, safety glasses must have side shields. That's one thing to look for. You have people wearing their glasses. Okay, fine, they're wearing their glasses. And maybe they're safety glasses. But if they don't have side shields on, they don't qualify. Kind of going into the noise area we talked about, the audiometric. If you look at this, the duration, this is how long you would be able to stay in that area according to OSHA's rule. And you notice that duration of eight hours at 90 decibels. Actually, we have 85 as a set for that. And then there's areas where it's more than 85 decibels in the plant. Then what we do is we do a, a study. Hearing tests. We test your hearing every year to determine if you have experienced hearing loss. What they call it is a standard threshold shift, an STS. That is hearing loss. Uh, standard threshold shift is a loss of about 10 decibels from these ranges. The 2,000, 3,000, and 4,000 megahertz or hertz ranges are kind of the average range for the ear. I believe the human ear can go from what, 200 to 20,000, uh, somewhere in that area. Hand protection, this is why we wear gloves. Hands are, have a lot of certain nerve endings, they're very manageable, very pliable, you can do a lot of things with them. If you mess them up, they, they hurt more. As a, res, as a result of that, let's make sure we wear those, those gloves and you have leeway to experiment with new gloves, like I said earlier. Uh, some of the cause of body, and body injuries, heat, metal splashing, tool impacts or impacts of any kind of material, cuts, hazardous chemicals, or contact with potentially infectious materials, which is probably the scarier one, stuff in the eye. And if you'll notice this one over here, I would have to say this is one of the scary ones, because these grinders are going at thousands of RPM, and those wheels will break, and when they break, they break catastrophically, and they'll send stuff. So make sure you always have your shield on, make sure you have your glasses on if you're nearby. In summary, employers must implement a PPE program where they are. You can see the signs, the equipment we provide. Assess the workplace hazards. And first of all, I mean, try to use an engineering control. If you can't do that, then PPE will come into play. Select the appropriate PPE to protect employees from the hazards that cannot be eliminated by the engineering controls. Inform the employees why the PPE is necessary and when it must be worn and need to inspect. Require employees to wear the selected PPE in the workplace. That's why we had the safety observations, one of the reasons. Right. Now 
we go to the third one. Hearing conservation, which kind of uh, had some uh, initial information in the previous presentation. Basically, we'll go back and visit this. If you look at this, 85, 110, 100, gunshot, 140, circular saw. Can you imagine a rotary saw or anything like that? 90 to 100. And I told you 85 was a magic number. You can see there's plenty of things here that'll cause problems for the year. Once again, kind of give you an idea. Uh, average TV is about 74. Now this is this is a uh, a logarithmic chart. This is not a a, a progression one. So so you say uh, 90 is a lot louder than 80. Uh, blenders. I know blenders can get pretty noisy, but even then they're only at about 80. Once again, you go to woodworking, rock concert, gunshot. You can see there's a lot of areas that exceed 85. We have seen 85 in several areas, which is why we had the hearing program. So to give you a little more information about this, doubling the distance from the sound source. If you're 50 feet away and then you go 100 feet away, that is dropping by six decibels. It's not cutting decibels in half. You're not going from 100 decibels to 50. You're going from 100 to 94. So you're still in that noise area. Um, effects, of course, we all know about this. Noise above 140 decibels causes pain and immediate hearing loss. Hopefully, it's temporary. Moving up, here's a way to tell if it's, if it's above 85 decibels. If you're talking to somebody, they're three feet away from you, and you have to shout, that means that you're above eight decibels. The noise is too high, and you should have hearing protection put in your ears. Normally, we have the uh, head, the headgear, or even the, the earplugs. The earplugs are better, but you can see that there's a rating, and the rating on the top it says 29 decibels, and that's the rating for the equipment. Now, it's found on the earmuff or earplug package. The other thing too. Imagine you put earplugs on, then you put uh, earmuffs on top of that. That's not going to increase, that's not going to double. If the ear, hearing protection of one is 29, the other is 29, you don't get 58. You get 29 plus 5. Just a heads up. But here's the downside of that 29 rating. If you don't wear it properly, squeeze it and let it go into the ear, and you just cut it on the outside, it'll be incorrectly inserted. Furthermore, even if it's well correctly inserted, you look at this EAR foam, that's what we have here at the plant. It's rated as a 29, but look, the effective rate is around 12 or 13. Basically, you take that 29 and you divide by two, and that's the protection that you're getting in the real world. In all cases where the sound levels equal or exceed the eight hour a weighted average of 85 decibels measured on a scale, a continuing effective hearing conservation program shall be administered. We have this, that's why we have the audiometric testing. Most of us develop a mild hearing loss as we age. Our body falls apart slowly as we get older. And it goes especially in the higher pitches, so 20,000 hertz, that's one of the places you start losing this hearing first. A severe or significant hearing loss at a younger age may mean you have had excessive noise exposure. It could be congenital or it could be your inborn environment. Audiometric testing done yearly can detect early stages of hearing loss. Not only can we monitor the, how we're doing here at the plant for uh, as far as noise and noise control and how we're dealing with it, but if somebody also has a personal health issue about that, that can also be uh, detected at the same time. Once again, STS, standard threshold shift, is defined as the change in the hearing threshold relative to the baseline, an average of 10 decibels at these two, three, and 4,000 hertz. When that 10 decibel is, is measured, the employee will have to be retested within 30 days. If it's confirmed, that's called a recordable. It's not a lost time accident 
or a near miss, is it's recordable. You compare the employee's current audiogram to the original baseline, and of course that baseline is adjusted over time to, to account for the age of the, uh, the worker. And you may not adjust for aging to determine whether or not hearing level is 25 or more above audiometric zero. Once again, if we do have a test failure, I have to get you to a testing facility within 30 days to retest. One of the things that happens when we do the testing is we will make sure that we're not sitting in the turbine department for you know, the, the previous day or, or that day we get tested. What we'll do is we'll get away, let the hearing, let the ears adjust, that way we get a clear test of what your hearing is. Having done all that, thank you very much. And the quizzes are attached to the email I send you. And all of you out there in TV land, hope you have a good day.